Welcome to our September garden tour. I've got a lot of tips and hints to show you as we go through the garden. Okay, right here we have cabbage. A couple of months ago I actually harvested this cabbage. Cut it off, made a cross in it. If you want to see what we did, go back to the harvest video. Then it sprouted up some new stems and created little cabbages. So that cabbage that we harvested before was an eight and a half pound cabbage. These little guys, they're probably only going to be like a six to eight ounce cabbage, but still totally edible. Now one of the things that's happened this last week is the temperatures rose and it actually cooked this cabbage. So you can see right here we've got some burn on it. They were nice and solid. I might be able to use this one um, if I peel off a lot of the outsides. These two, three here are going to be pretty good still. But if you wait too long, they split open as well. So make sure you get them when they're nice and firm, get them harvested, and be careful when it gets really hot. Now savoy cabbage, like this one right here, these tolerate the heat really well. I guess it's the savoy on it that just kind of makes them more layered and they don't get as hot and cooky inside. So <laughs> anyways, these are great for um, growing in hot climates and through the summertime might need to cover just a little bit, but still, these are a lot better than the smooth leaf cabbages. Right above the cabbage, I have okra, and I've got two different varieties. This shorter variety was planted at the same time as this tall guy, but this one was some seed that I saved last year from a hybrid. Now, when you save seed from hybrids, sometimes you get something good, sometimes you don't get anything good because they're never true to their parent plant. So if you plan on doing it, plan on it just being kind of an experiment and don't expect it to be anything great. So it's just fun to play around with, but as you can see, it isn't producing yet. It hasn't even started to flower. I'm starting to see the flowers just starting to develop. So it'll be interesting to see how they turn out. But this one here, it's done so well and we've just been picking off of this. And the more you pick, the better off you're gonna be. Because if you stop picking, then it ends up wanting to put all of his energy into seed. And that's fine if that's your um, idea is to save your seed off of it. But this right here is about six inches and that's way too big. That's gonna be super woody. It isn't gonna taste good. And so the size really that you want is going to be something smaller, like two inches to three inches. Then they're nice and tender. Now, when they're this size, this is about two inches, you can actually eat this raw. And if you haven't tried it, and even smaller, they're better. If you haven't tried it, I suggest you give it a shot because the first time I was told to do it, I thought the guy was crazy. And once I decided to do it, it was really good. And I love coming out here and snacking on these. So they do have that mucilaginous quality in it, which is really awesome if you've got tight joints. It just kind of lubricates them a little bit. Um, it's just kind of like a little medicine in a pod here. But use clippers when you're doing it because um, especially if they're a little bit bigger, they don't snap off as easy. The smaller ones do snap off a little bit easier. When it blooms, it blooms in the morning and it starts to close up in the evening time and the blossoms are really beautiful. They look just like the hibiscus. So okra is one of those really cool things, grows nice and tall, loves the heat, which is perfect for our environment. But remember to pick it on a day-to-day -day basis and pick them when they're two to three inches and no bigger than that. Right up here we got a tiny little smattering of the cactus zinnias and this is something that the monarchs really like and in fact on September 1st we saw our first monarch here and now we're seeing more and more and as the fall as we come into fall we'll start seeing more and more of the monarchs so it's always good to have some things out here in the garden for them to feed off of so this um, zinnia and some fennel and some of the other things are really good in the garden. So another really th uh, great crop that I really like is this Eureka bean. Excuse me, Luna. Okay, one of the things that I really like about it is they're very uniform in size. And as you can see right there, super easy to pick because they grow in clumps. So I can go through here and pick this little section out really fast. This is the first time I have grown the Eureka beans um, this year and I really love these. The downside is, is they're not good raw, but they're excellent cooked or pickled. So Eureka bean, I'll be continuing to produce that one. This is probably my best wax bean I've ever grown. 
right here is our sweet potatoes. So we have these all over the place and they're virtually one of the easiest things that we grow here. There really isn't any pests that bother them. Um, the biggest thing is, is to make sure that you get them in the ground after your frost date because they are very sensitive to cold and make sure that the soil is really well amended and loose. And then they just kind of take over. They're kind of crazy. They grow like crazy. They flop out into the rows. And so I just end up throwing them back on top, top of themselves or you can just literally take off these long runners and cut them off and compost them. The leaves are even edible, so you can use those like you would grape leaves and do um, rice rolls or something like that. Um, so they're totally edible. So in a pinch, you know, you could have more food. And then when you, we start to get into September, I'll start to look in the base of where I actually planted them. And if we start to see the sweet potatoes starting to rise up out of the soil, I'll kind of move it away to see if they're big enough. If they're big enough, go ahead and harvest them. Other ways, wait for the end of the month of September or 1st of October. But be sure that you get them out before we have a frost. Because if the frost damages the leaves, it actually damages the fruit below too. And on a word of caution, when you're harvesting your own sweet potatoes at home, be really careful with them um, when you're digging them up so that you don't put holes in them because then they don't keep as well. And use them, you know, pick them out of there gently. And one of the things that I did when we first grew sweet potatoes is I dug them up, and I hucked them over into a bucket and I completely ruined the whole batch because I bruised them all. And so lesson learned, hard lessons, we never forget them. Um, so now I'm more gentle with them and they'll last me all winter long. So right up here on this windmill is this crazy Malabar spinach. I think we've shown it in a couple of our other videos. Um, he's taken over, he's, he's gotten clean up into the top there. I might have to cut that one out, but it's starting to bloom. And so this is one of those great things to grow if you live in a hot environment because you can have spinach and greens during the middle of summertime. So this would be a great food option for summer. Uh, it really likes it when it's hot. And you can see right here we've got, we've got two colors here on the seed pods themselves. They start off pink when they're blooming and then when they start to get ripe these dark colored um, almost black purple color uh, these are these are the seeds and they're just starting to get ready you can also use the seed pods as dye for some things you know for fabrics or yarns or something this is a great purpley dye it gives you that really neat color there see how pretty that is and then the seeds right inside this and i would suggest you save the seed off of these because sometimes these are hard to find and even though they reseed themselves just secure your food source. So Malabar spinach, I think it's one of my top greens for summer and it'll go until we have a frost. Okay, so here's another really awesome crop to have during the heat. Um, it's just another type of spinach and this is New Zealand spinach. When it gets 106, sometimes the edges just get a little bit burnt, so some nice cover um, of some sort would be fine for this. But it grows upright, it puts some nice leaves off of it, uh, it'll put a little bit of flower, but it just produces and produces until we have a frost, which is kind of opposite of what our other regular leaf spinach does. But this is another really good option to have to be able to grow something green when you just want those really good greens during summertime. So New, New Zealand spinach, another really good choice for greens in the garden. Okay, now tomatoes. This is where we have to kind of make a decision. Um, you know, and you just never know when your first frost is actually going to come. You have a general idea, like ours is usually November 1st, and what I know is we've had it earlier and we've had it much, much later. We've had it clean into Christmas. We've had tomatoes go and go and go. But I also have to make that decision whether or not they're going to be producing from here on out. So I have a little bit here and I've got a lot of tomatoes down inside here. Um, they're pretty green. And the best way that you can actually get these to start ripening is snip the tops. And I do have to be careful because we're still hot here. So I want to still have some shade for them. But anything that doesn't have a tomato on it, I'm going to start nipping all of this off. This is just called topping. Oh, look what I just did. I took the one off. <laughs> oh, well. That made the decision for me. I'll go in here deeper. And so I'll just come in here and I'll move remove as much as I can without cutting more tomatoes off. 
and top this whole guy off. So I'll go in and I'll take him off the side. So what this does is put the energy into that tomato and helps it to ripen. Another thing that you can do when you're getting closer to a frost, we're still six weeks out before we have a frost. Um, ish and so you can cut back the water on that and by cutting back the water that stresses the plant and that causes that tomato to ripen so if you feel like you're gonna have a frost for sure and you just want to downsize your tomato plants come through here and top it all off shape it up make it smaller and put all of that energy into the tomato so it can ripen this right here was the blue cocoa bean that we tried for the first time this year and I was really happy with it through the month of August. It produced like crazy. Then once September came, the 106 degrees that we've had for the last week, you can see it started to burn the, the leaves and the little uh, beans that were on it have all dropped off. This is really typical when it gets really hot and dry like this. The, there's no humidity, the hot temperatures shrivel them up and then they just fall off. So if your pole beans aren't producing, it is because of the hot temperatures more than likely if you have hot temperatures. And so once the temperatures drop again, and I suppose they will in a few weeks, we'll start to get production again. But I've really liked it. It just got that nice kind of purpley blue color. And the more sun it gets, the more um, vibrant bluey purple it looks. And then if it's kind of hidden down in the uh, plant itself it's more of a green color so this has been really productive up until now so i'm happy with it next year i'll probably grow it along the fence line and do more than just a few beans all right it's winter squash time and you can start to tell when they start to ripen because they get a really hard skin on them but also the plants kind of start to die back september is a good indication as well but i've got some mashed potatoes right here along with a few weeds don't look but I've got some mashed potato um, winter squash and this is an acorn variety. So it's kind of hard to tell when they're ripe because they don't develop that color. But they're nice and hard. They never get really, really big. But when you pick these guys, definitely use clippers. And the reason that you want to do that is if you break it off and it breaks off at the base right here, they don't keep as long. So you need to use them right away. And you want them to cure to develop a really good, rich flavor. So these are phenomenal. And if you haven't tried it, try them next year because I tell you what, um, I like this better than the regular acorn squash. They're so creamy and they're so good. And honestly, I could just eat this all winter long because they are that good. But they don't develop that color like a, a uh, butternut or a spaghetti squash. They just stay white. But if you leave them out there too long without any cover, then they'll start to get a brown hue on them if it, the sun is hot. So it's time to start harvesting the winter squash and start curing them. The best way to cure these is just to put them out um, on a table in the shade though. You don't want them in full sun because you don't want them to get burnt. And then about two weeks, start eating them. You can eat them right away, but they just develop such a better flavor once they've sat around just a little bit. Spaghetti squash is super easy to tell when it's ready. It develops a nice yellow color on all sides of it. Now this one here, has a little bit of green on the bottom and I'm gonna go ahead and leave that there for a little bit. If I had to, I could pick it and it would develop, but it's never as yummy as it is when you let them fully develop and be bind ripe like this guy right here. So I'll let this cure for a little bit. Spaghetti squash is just an awesome winter vegetable that will last you easily until March and sometimes a little bit longer if you cure it properly. Then there's also some delicata squash that we've got all throughout here. These are just little bush varieties that I've planted and Generally off of one we get about, I don't know, a 12 to 15 of these little squashes on there. They're kind of like a little serving, a uh, single serving, and you can eat the skins on these as well. These are super good too. If you haven't tried them, I suggest growing one of these. Bush varieties don't take up as much room, and so if you don't have a big garden, that's a really good option. But super, super good. Make sure that you pick with the with the little stems on them so that they last longer. If they happen to break off, use those first. And if you notice right here, we're starting to get some powdery mildew. So I don't generally worry about it, but I don't want to put this in the compost just in case I don't get all of this out um, through the heating process. And I don't want to reintroduce that into my garden. And you know, it's been a dry year. This is pretty common to see. And you'll also see it at the end of the season too. So I'll come through here, I'll clean all of this out. I'll mend it really well. And this area here where my squash was is gonna be where my garlic's gonna go in. So I'm kind of excited to have some squash and get ready for garlic at the same time. All good things coming for fall. 
This is hops and I love growing this as a medicinal herb on the outskirts of my garden on the fence line. It serves lots of benefits. Um, I let it kind of grow over the fence and then the ducks kind of have a nice place that's nice and cool during the summertime and then gives them kind of a private area to be able to lay their eggs in. And it's used in floral arrangements, wedding bouquets, it's used to make beer. But my reason is, is I harvest these guys and I use it as a sedative or a nervine. It helps with anxiety, it's a bitter, and it helps with the digestion. So this is a great herb to have and it's pretty productive and it's time to start harvesting it. And if you look under here, there's all kinds of hops growing. They're pretty, they're pretty prolific. And I'll just come through here and I'll take all of these off and I'll put them in my, my food dehydrator. And the, the way I know that they're ready is they kind of have a stickiness to them. And then when you open up these bracts, you can see the pollen in there. And the pollen is the most, um, it, it's the most beneficial, it's, it has the most medicine in it. And so that's the time to harvest it. And so when I, when I dry this, I'll put it up for the year. I'll make tinctures out of it. I don't really like it as a tea because it is very, very bitter. Um, but I can sneak some other stuff in there to make it taste good. But I love the way it looks growing on the outside of the fence. And this time of year, it's just so productive and fun to have in the garden. This is horseradish, and it's a perennial vegetable. Once we have a really hard frost, then I'll harvest the root of it. We'll make fire cider, and my husband loves fresh horseradish root. The peppers, they've just been so productive this year. Of course, most of the time, they're pretty productive here. The color of these orange snackers are just beautiful. I love that. We gotta make sure we keep them covered though. Then we've got pasillas. Pasillas, pasillas have that really good smoky flavor. They're a good substitute for the ancho pepper. You can stuff them but they're a little bit smaller so it's harder. So they're great just chopped up and put in Mexican dishes and omelets, anything. Jalapenos. Look at the color. Now think about making poppers with those. That's some neat color that we've got here. And then down underneath, we've got more of these lemon spice jalapenos. And you can see right here that this little guy, he's a lot smaller than the other pepper plants that we have. So peppers, super easy here in the heat. We love peppers. Another one of my favorite new ones that I've tried this year is the lemon jalapeno spice. This one is more of a stocky plant. It's shorter. It's not near as big as the other plants, but it's very, very prolific. The taste really good. The color is really neat. This has just been a fun new try. Let us know in the comments below what you've tried new this year. The peppers have been really good this year. They've been productive. Our biggest problem is, is the sun and making sure that we keep them covered. This is one of my artichokes that we've got in the garden. It's a perennial vegetable and this one here produced about 35 artichokes. This thing was huge in its prime. Six foot tall, six foot wide, and then it got smaller after it produced. And as you can see right here, that it's got the old um, stems that we had to cut back. And it was practically dead looking, which is very, very common for them. That's just with our progression. But we've got to make sure we cut them back. And at this time, we have to start thinking about spring. So I'm going to feed it some bone meal and I'll put about a half of a cup around the base of it. And then I'll put compost around that as well. Two to three inches or more to make it just plump up for spring so that it'll produce a nice amount next year. Now if you want to check, check out the progression of this guy, go back to our May, June, July, and August um, garden tours and you can see how it's evolved. It's pretty cool. So I hope you've enjoyed all of our garden tips, our tour, and until next time, we'll see ya. That's not a weed. <laughs>